I am recording. Excellent. All right, thanks. Francie, welcome everyone to the um, seventh of eight Climate Action Task Force meetings. Uh, I will go through the agenda quickly and then uh, we'll jump in. We have a lot to cover today. Um, so I'm going to do my best to both honor and respect the conversation that needs to happen as well as to try to keep us moving forward. Um, so we have a public comment period to the best of our knowledge. There is no one from the public present. Um, Lisa says, no, there's not. So then uh, the second order of business is to review the round two draft recommendations and approve them as a collective. And we'll talk a little bit more about kind of what that means. Um, and then we will take a brief look at the outline for the report that's being developed based on all of the work from this group, uh, as well as including work from the outreach work uh, and survey that we did or the questionnaire that we did uh, and the work with the Just Transitions Plan Committee. So we'll talk about that. Uh, we will speak briefly today about the presentation to council, although uh, that will be more of the focus next time. So we'll touch on that today, and then we'll we'll take a deeper dive into that next week. Um, and then one of the bigger decisions, in addition to approving the round two recommendations, is to discuss governance. Um, so we'll be talking about the future of this work and the governing body or bodies that may be um, available as well as sort of how you individually might be involved. But our focus is actually on what group is going to carry the work forward and how. And then we'll finish up by um, talking about next steps, including scheduling and upcoming deadlines. So that's the agenda that we have um, and that was, was posted to you as well. Um, before we begin, are there any additions or comments on the agenda? And can everyone hear me okay? No. No, no please. Okay. Okay, hearing, uh, hearing no additions to the agenda, and believing we have no public comment, uh, we'll move into the draft round two recommendations. So um, thank you uh, for, for incorporating the feedback from the um, staff and the task force in your recommendations. Um, our, our business today is to, um, while, while we understand that you broke into subgroups to develop the recommendations, we do want a uh, unified, if not a consensus, move forward uh, related to what is presented to council. So each of you as a task force member has a responsibility to essentially endorse the recommendations that move forward to be presented to council. Um, now, that can be, you know, I think last time we kind of did, you know, you want to be north of 50%, 75% to 100% good with the recommendations. Um, this group doesn't have the sort of, I think, time and, and capacity to really get everyone all the way to 100%, but you want to be mostly good with the recommendations that are going forward. Um, so today we want to look at those round two recommendations again. You all should have seen those through the review process. Um, two of the subgroups provided updated recommendations. I think there's a bit of a question um, regarding the resiliency and adaptation subgroup and uh, how to move forward with, with those recommendations. Um, and that I, th I think that group in particular has struggled to meet the um, sort of the review cycle and, and there are a number of reasons for that. So we want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, any clarifying questions about the role of the task force related to the recommendations before I um, post the recommendations for you to look at? Josie, I do just want to note that we have 10 people that are missing from this meeting tonight. Um, we have two people that are, it sounds like, trying to get on, but that is more than half of the members. So 
I do want to have an opportunity to make sure we're sticking to our agenda and going through the round two recommendations, but I would also recommend that we do a follow up email with the rest of the members that aren't present tonight to make sure that people have an opportunity to at the very least, you know, do the thumbs down with any of those recommendations um, before we finalize and move forward. I do want to be able to respect those folks that aren't able to participate tonight. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, and, and that's a very important point. And uh, so we will, we will do that as well. Um, in addition, uh, the meeting is also being recorded. So hopefully those who are not able to participate will be able to um, watch at least the key sections of the meeting to get additional context. Any other comments or clarifying questions before we review the round two recommendations? Quiet group. Hi, this is Lynette. I just joined. Sorry, I'm late. Glad you could uh, be with us, Lynette. Um, Francie, I think I made you the host, and it's saying that I need permission from the host to screen share. Okay, I uh, I just changed it to multiple participants can share, mm -hmm. so you should okay. be able to share now. Thank you. All right, is everyone able to see my screen? Everyone's Zoom acumen has grown exponentially in the last <laughs> couple of months. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, uh, so I, I think it might be nice to hear um, just a minute or so from each of the um, each of the the folks who started the recommendations. Um, so let's. Um, so let's talk about the agri, like, so first, I think we want to just present each recommendation briefly and particularly if you made any substantial changes to the recommendation based on feedback. So just as a reminder, um, the last time that the whole group saw the recommendations was in their unupdated form. So it would be nice to, to say briefly, what is the recommendation as well as what changes, if any, that are substantive. I don't think we need to go into the details, obviously, but if there were any major changes that um, have happened since the time that people had a chance to look at it, it would be great for you to uh, share that with the group. So is there someone that would like to volunteer? Um, and again, I realize we're missing quite a few folks, so um, we may not have everyone present who for each recommendation, but we'll, we'll do the best we can. So extended agricultural zoning, is someone willing to speak to that, Marsha? Um, so first of all, I'll say I did not take a topic in land use and waste management. So I, my role in this was pulling it together and um, doing the updates and stuff. But I, so if there's somebody here that worked on it more, I will defer to them, but I don't recall that there is. So just check. Yeah, it sounds like I'm it. Um, okay. So, um, the first, the first topic that we, um, and I think we spent probably the most effort on this one, was extending agricultural zoning, which um, uh, really means putting in um, uh, a lot of ways to facilitate agricultural zoning uh, inside the city. So people can have front yard gardens, backyard gardens, the uh, we would uh, create uh, neighborhood or regional cooperatives so that to, to create markets for uh, agricultural and floral produce. Um, and uh, so, it, oh, and um, scientific help to uh, uh, encourage people to grow hair, uh, 
heirloom crops and things that are hard to find in the grocery store, preserving uh, genetic diversity in the legacy. And so those are the reasons that it's uh, a citywide cooperative. Um, and uh, if you look at the wider recommendation, uh, we came up with some resources for places uh, in, in Europe that, that do this and um, well, you know, what the value propositions of it are. Um, and uh, I think I that's probably a, all I got. Can I ask a question about this? I'm, I'm wondering, um, does that require a code change? Because I've seen vegetables growing in front yards. Is it because they, they're going to sell produce that makes it necessary to have a code change? Um, there are a couple of, uh, there are a couple of things um, uh, that you need code changes so that uh, homeowner associations can't rule it out. Uh, oh, you okay. need code changes for the, to, to create the market and then you would need appropriations for the subsidies that would be needed to get it going. Okay, great. Thank you. Marcia, could, this is Peter. Could I just ask one question? I wondered whether there was any reference to community gardens as it, in augmenting, it all seemed very backyard, private home orientation and very little emphasis on the community aspect. Um, no, actually there, um, there is language in it about, uh, uh, I don't think it goes as far given the amount of time we had on round two, it doesn't go as far as identifying tracts of land that could be used for community gardens, but it, it does mention establishing uh, land cooperatives and, and uh, allotments on yeah. unused land from anywhere from, you know, the banks of, of ditches to um, some public open space and allotting that to people who live in apartments and stuff where they don't uh, have Great. private land of their own. Great. And the nature of the clarifying questions works right now. And I wanna emphasize that we are only asking clarifying questions at this time, not um, debating the merits and we'll, we'll move into that in a minute. So right now we just want to make sure that everyone understands the recommendations as they mm -hmm. stand and then we can talk, um, then we'll move into assessing them. But first is just to understand what's here. All right, any additional clarifying questions for this recommendation? Um, before we move on to the next one, I do want to do a moment of housekeeping. Um, I realize that some of you may be calling in on a combination of a telephone and a computer, um, but I'd like to clarify who's on the call. So I see a number from 303-681-7722. Can you identify who that is? This is, this is Lynette. Okay, great. Thank you, Lynette. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have a seven, I have a number ending in 1452. This is Joni. Joni, great, thank you. Another ending in 8075. Uh, Andy Butcher. Great, hi Andy. Um, all right, I think that should be everyone. Um, Francie, do you have any questions? Did I miss anyone? Oh, I think I got everyone now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thanks for that uh, brief intermission <laughs> to do a roll call. Um, so let's go to the next one, residential and commercial composting. Is there someone from that group who is able to speak to that one? Marcia? Yes. Um, uh, again, you know, we have we have some barriers to going farther than this. Than and this recommendation really is uh, aimed at two things. One is to eliminate the barriers or find find ways around the barriers, 
and the other way, uh, other is to make use of or the benefits of, of composting. Um, so we can, we cannot provide composting for commercial businesses, um, but we can require that they uh, use uh, a third party uh, a waste diversion program uh, to compost. That's what Boulder does. The state does not allow municipalities to require people to use their composting service. Um, uh, so that's in there. Um, the um, changing, ch changing uh, the subscription policy from opt in to opt out so that anybody new who acquires uh, city service, city waste diversion services um, is automatically entered in the composting program and they have to do something specific to opt out. Um, other trivially, trivia about making it easier like um, bundling, offering smaller uh, compost bins in certain neighborhoods and, and things like that. Um, and then the other way around is to provide um, subscriptions for people who want to do uh, urban agriculture um, to get hold of, of composted products in either powered, powdered or tea form. Um, uh, and so that it at least feels like uh, you're getting the full circle benefits of, of composting. That is your, your garbage goes away and fertilizer comes back. Um, that's uh, because of the arrangement that the city has now um, with a composting service. That's not necessarily easy to do, but it's part of the recommendation. Marsha, any clarifying questions on this recommendation? Moving on, uh, downtown pay for parking. I can do that one. Great, thanks Phil. Phil Greenwald from the city of Longmont. Um, just real quick, we had written up kind of a very basic outline of this. And um, obviously what happened was when we um, started to move into the different issues with COVID, we weren't able to put a lot of meat to the bones, I guess, as it were. So appreciate everybody's comments. We got a lot of comments back from folks about um, trying to make this better. And so we did try to incorporate that into this, into the document. Um, there were a lot of issues with how are we impacting folks, um, especially those with, um, you know, people with disabilities and people who might be um, not as able to get around. So what we really try to say is, mm, if you have a handicap placard or a handicap license plate, I mean, that's the way they're called, unfortunately, but it is with people with disabilities is really the term that's more appropriate. And so we really tried to indicate that when, if you do have a, either one of these items that you can pretty, you can park wherever you'd like to with any time limits uh, and everything basically is, is kind of goes away as far as any kind of enforcement on those types of uh, individuals. So that's one piece. And then really trying to open up the parking along Main Street and try to do this in a phased fashion so that, um, you know, as you're, as you're bringing on, you don't just maybe make it paid parking for the whole entire region. So we really wanted to get through the idea of that there's a phased process to this as well. And so it's not just a blanket coverage of entire downtown immediately. And if, uh, also with COVID, we had to explain the piece that you know, this, is, this isn't probably something that's going to happen tomorrow or even this year. It's going to have to be one of those things that we have to consider as far as how it impacts businesses as they currently are. And so there was a lot of, there's a couple of comments anyway that came back about how are you going to make this work with COVID currently impacting our businesses so much in the downtown and making people have to pay now seems, seems uh, really, really tough on folks. So um, we try to incorporate all these pieces that it's really more of the phased approach and it can happen, you know, as we start to recover from a lot of these different things. So it's not something that happens immediately, but 
it also could happen, you know, it could happen uh, more quickly as well as if, if we do the phased approach. And um, some of the comments were interesting because it really talked about how, um, you know, if you have paid, if you do paid parking, um, it's really tough then to get people to walk and bike downtown. Well, as Marsha pointed out in one of our comments, I mean, it's really about the idea that um, if you're paying for parking, you, there's an incentive then to leave your car at home and then take a bicycle or, or walk to downtown if you're close enough to be able to do that. And really, if you phase it, you're really trying to keep those spaces along Main Street opened up. And typically when you do a parking plan, it's keeping 15% of the open of the spaces along your paid parking open continually. So you always have a space and you're not going around and around in circles, you know, wasting a lot of gasoline and, and putting a lot of pollutants into the air. You have a space fairly immediately. And there was some issue about, well, then only the rich benefit from this because only if you can afford a parking space can you get the really good space. I mean, the idea is as people pay for their parking, that money could be reinvested into the downtown and provide better links for pedestrians and bicyclists. So with that, I think I'll stop, but if there are any questions, I'd be happy to, to entertain them. I'm just Karen, I'm wondering if, um, it seems to me, um, there's a lot of people in our town who are my age and older, and we don't typically walk a mile or bike. Um, I tried biking and I fell off several times because I had no sense of balance. And so at some point we have to realize that it, in our current system, it's gonna be very difficult to get rid of cars in the city center. I, I think what we'll see unfortunately is people moving to uh, restaurants away from the city center. Is there any way to do a study or um, um, just talk maybe with people who are parking downtown to see what they would see as alternatives. I guess I'm um, not, oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, you probably have a better answer than I do, Phil. Um, one of the things that we sort of put in during the review period uh, was, was to introduce the idea, and obviously this has to be a post-pandemic innovation because people don't like to be on, on uh, multiple person uh, uh, vehicles right now. Um, but the idea would be that um, for people who don't want to walk, that we would have a very frequent, very high frequency electric shuttles and, and ring parking around uh, the high occupancy area that we want to have so that uh, it would be like 16th Street Mall uh, in, in Denver where you wouldn't have to walk more, more than, uh, you know, a hundred feet or so from where you got to the shuttle to your off the shuttle to your destination. Um, and you would still be able to be a car based person. We just have this wonderful um, pedestrian mall uh, where you could hang out and then not have to walk a long way to get home either. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another piece of that, if I can just add on is, and, and thanks Marsha for bringing up the idea of the, the shuttles. Um, that was a big component of this also to make sure that we had a shuttle program that, you know, this could, again, you can use the money that you generate and I'm, I, I don't want to make sure, make it a panacea of like, it, it's going to pay for everything, but um, you know, that you would be able to put some of that money back into a system of shuttles and maybe there's some other subsidies that come into play. I think um, Marsha put some good language in there about business owners and other folks that may, might have um, some stake in this to, to invest in the shuttle system as well. But the other idea is that, um, you know, as, as, um, as we try to open it up for, um, or as we try so, to, yep. I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you on this. I want to um, try to get us to just enough information where, Sorry. no, it's okay. It's just, uh, again, I, I know we have a long agenda tonight and I want to make sure that we get through it. So if we can um, see if there are any, and you know, obviously everyone is welcome to, and we will share the full recommendations um, and still do a final approval of, of the whole package next round. Um, 
but in the meantime, are there any um, additional clarifying questions that anyone has regarding the structure of this recommendation? And if you're not speaking, it would be really helpful if you could mute yourself. There, the background noise does get to be a bit much. I know it's hard to turn yourself off and on too, but um, yeah. So anyway, are there further clarifying questions um, about the structure of this recommendation. If I could just make one last that last point. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. It's just that by incenting people to not drive as much and those people who can use bicycles and, and, and can walk are not driving downtown, then you're opening it up for everybody, for, for people who can, who have to drive. Thank you, Phil. All right, seeing no additional questions, we'll move into education and outreach. Um, Peter, I know you did a lot of work on these and kind of led this group. Um, so I will leave it up to you to decide if you would like to present each of these or if you would like to uh, ask one of your teammates to do that. And uh, again, I will just, request that you're mindful of the time in your explanation of the recommendation. And you are muted. If you can unmute yourself. And Francie, I think you're capable of doing that as well. Peter, we still can't hear you, unfortunately. I was gonna just there say- you are. We got good feedback on all of these and tried to incorporate as much as we could. I think this first one is really the most important. It's the one that I had the least to do with and maybe uh, Joni or Ann or others would like to speak to it, but there were there. So I'll toss it to them first if they want to comment. Um, this is Joni. I mean, if somebody has a specific question about the workforce rec development recommendations, just let me know or let us know. Thanks. I just add that there's no, no question that there's a real, that we're already doing some good things in this area, but there's an obvious possibility to expand and expand pretty rapidly. And this proposal was designed to create a, a, a program and a committee that would oversee that process over the next couple of years. Okay, moving on to the lecture series. This is the one that has the nice advantage of already being funded through a grant from CU. So we've been working with the Longmont Museum to see if we could set up a lecture series. The COVID problem that pushes us back to the spring and even then we're not sure. So one of the changes, one of the revisions we made was to make sure um, that the museum would be able to provide some alternative way for people to access this if we couldn't have meetings in their beautiful big uh, auditorium. It, judging from the feedback, it raised some interesting questions about whether everything we do should be very local and very present oriented and speaking to specific needs or my own preference, I guess, is that in some of our recommendations, we should actually be trying to pull back and take a bigger picture and, and uh, get people more broadly. None of us know as much as we need to and we have good access to people who can uh, help broaden the discussion. So this one is definitely intended more towards broadening the discussion. Thank you, Peter. Any clarifying questions from the group? Karen, it looks like you're 
uh, saying something. Yeah, so there is a CU grant for this. Is that what you said, Peter? It came yes. Oh, they, thank you. Their humanities program has a special outreach program and we applied to that and they gave us $5,000. I've worked with the folks at the museum on how that best be spent for support and publicity and, and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Just as a FYI, I muted the phone number who ends in 7722 just because there was a lot of background noise. I just wanted to make that person aware in case they tried to talk. And you should be able to unmute yourself if you need to talk. Uh, newspaper. I think the background share noise is still there. On number three, the newspaper article series, this is obviously old time 20th century communication technology, but the if the Times call can survive a few more years, uh, they've run some good articles recently doing historical projects. They had a nice piece on the 1918 influenza epidemic in Longmont. And the idea behind this would be to put together a, a series of short articles aimed at the public that tried to, if the earlier one was the big picture, this would be trying to localize issues of, of climate change for the local community, try to make it locally relevant. Since I'm a historian, my push is often to try to reach back to the beginning and, and try to tell a progressive story. How the heck did we get in this crazy situation? Um, but I think there's um, possibilities. It seems like this is an appropriate time to add that starting Friday, anyway, certainly today, um, we have a new local newsroom in Longmont that um, is called the Longmont Leader. It's uh, funded by the McClatchy Google uh, project and their objective is to become 100% uh, local over a period of some number of years, um, as opposed to the to the Times Call, which is um, no longer present in Longmont, other than um, one reporter. Um, so we just should not assume that the that the Times Call is necessarily the vehicle. If that's the free copy that I got thrown on my driveway a couple of weeks ago, I was pretty dubious, but maybe that was something else. The uh, Longmont Leader is actually 100% online as the Longmont okay. Observer was. Okay, good. Um, that was something else. Yeah, I don't know what you got on your porch, but that you was, wouldn't start a paper newspaper now. It was, yeah, it was bad. Yeah, okay. Well, that's good to know. There may be an amendment to this one regarding an online newspaper right. versus a paper newspaper. I think right. that, would, that sounds, I doubt anyone is going to vote for or against this based on if it's a, on a physical piece of paper or not. I think that's probably safe. Um, okay, any- That was gonna be my comment, Josie, is just, is this, could this be geared toward being an electronic, not just newspaper, but like social media posts or something Mm -hmm. else that we could follow electronically. And Peter, did the group make any accommodation for that um, in the recommendation itself, or might that be something that would be down the road? I think we already put that in. We added, we certainly added something about trying to do a Spanish language version, um, but that I'll have to go back and check. Yeah, so maybe just flag a note for that one to, um, you know, sort of adapt to the media outlets um, that, that seem most viable over time. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I should add that the, that the leader, uh, if you submit something to the leader and it's published, it gets spread across social media automatically. 
Okay. Meaning that the city doesn't have to spend money on it. All right. And then the last, the next, not no, the last one. But, oh, I guess uh, two more. The number four is pretty simple and hinges. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the permanent exhibit that's at the Longmont Museum called Front Range Rising, but they, it's a it's a really wonderful um, condensed uh, condensed version of of Longmont history, and they it's can be used in various ways. And I think without it's without changing the exhibit, it could be presented in a way um, that put emphasis on on climate change and energy use uh, change over time. Um, and uh, I've worked there as a docent with that exhibit. I'm pretty familiar with it. So I have a, a, a sense of what that could be. And I've talked to people at the museum who seem um, at least interested. I can't speak for them, um, but I think there's a possibility of doing something good there. Peter, do you have a clarification on the timeline? Uh, how far um, out do you think it would be before the proposed updates might happen to that exhibit? Realizing well, that there's, you know, yeah, other I, factors at play, but. Um, I, I think we could put 2021 or 2022 in there, either, either one. I think that the key is that the exhibit is already in place um, and, and uh, they, they are thinking, I gather, about uh, changing it if they go into some major update or, or renovation or improvement. Hopefully we could be involved in that and have a say, but I think even as it exists currently, simply by changing um, some of the ways that it's presented or certain things are highlighted, I think the story could be told pretty well. So in a sense, it's, um, it's a low budget thing that would not, not uh, impinge on the, on the museum's other work. Would you like to propose 2021 or 2022? Knowing that over time given things our, may change. Given all our current problems, I guess I'd say 22. Um, and then we'll we could come in ahead of time instead of behind. And then the last one for this group, I'm guessing there's not a lot of clarifying questions. That one's quite straightforward. I don't want to shortchange the process. Okay. Um, community sustainability liaison program. I speak uh, quickly to what that program is. Maybe. I can talk about that one. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was just inspired by our discussion with the Just Transition Committee. And um, so I recommended this sustainability liaison program around, um, I know the city's like spending a lot on messaging and like trying to get some of these, the word out about a lot of these programs, but it's still not exactly either getting to certain communities or they're, you know, maybe don't understand the significance or the ins and outs of the program. Um, so yeah, I was suggesting that we have volunteer um, liaisons who, you know, are well known in their community and maybe they can talk to their church groups or, you know, local, you know, their kids' schools and local groups like that, and they can talk about certain programs that the city is offering. Um, you know, if they someone wants to add compost and they don't know how to do it and about energy efficiency programs or weatherization, um, you know, just like really connecting, being the voice in the community, um, letting people know about these things. Thank you, Michelle. Um, any clarifying questions regarding this recommendation? Marsha? Oh, you were just No, I was just hand. waving to people coming into my house. <laughs> Got it. 
Okay. Um, so I would like to ask a question of the members of the resiliency and adaptation subgroups who are present. Um, so uh, I guess first is if you have intention to uh, make additional updates, to the best of my knowledge, we did not receive updates from this updated recommendations from this group. Um, I know there have been a number of scheduling and workload challenges associated with that. Um, but it would be helpful before we go through these recommendations to understand from that group what the intention is. Um, so uh, I don't know who, who or which of you would like to speak to that, but it would be helpful to the group for us to know. Uh, this is Karen. I went through mine, the public health piece, independently. Um, I know there was a lot of things written on there, like there's too many coalitions already. We don't want another coalition, but that's not something that I chose to um, add into here. I don't know if everybody else on the team got a chance to look at theirs. I didn't hear from um, any of them. I know that uh, Lynette's on the team and um, I can't think of the other person's name, <laughs> um, is also I, one other team member. I haven't heard from some of the members since the last time we met. I think everybody's lives are kind of upended, but. So I think Loss, Lynette, um, I believe Ocean was on this team. Francie, do you know? Francie said no. No, I think um, Ocean was on land use. I believe it was uh, uh, Greg, Magnolia, and Loss. Right, and Greg's not here today. Um, So, and I think though for the recommendations that were made, um, Lynette, you did the water conservation and Bloss, you worked on the flooding mitigation and preparedness. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Okay, so, um, you know, again, understanding that everybody's lives are pretty upended right now. Um, we'd be interested to know, does the recommendation as it stands, um, do you feel like the comments from um, the task force and staff are, are represented or are you hoping for a little bit of time to be able to update this recommendation? Are you talking to me? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sorry, <laughs> I got confused. That's okay. Um, uh, I've not read the uh, recommendations or comments on this yet. I was hoping to, I was, I was out of town this weekend, but um, I can certainly do that in short order and tweak this if necessary. I mean, the whole idea behind this um, flooding mitigation thing is basically just information, just trying to get information to the public what what it is what it is I mean it's uh, it's just a program that's been around for a long time. Uh, all cities are part of it. Uh, however, it, if they need technical information, that's not something you can easily convey to the common citizen. But we can at least have a program so that they can understand how it works and what concerns they need to have if they are near or in a floodplain that floods. Uh, in a 100 year period, which just I just wanted to clarify 100 year period means it's very possible that there is a flood within 100 years. That doesn't mean there's only one flood in 100 years. And I suspect that we will probably experience more floods down the road. Um, and that's part of the climate change that we're experiencing. Um, the weather is be the weather patterns are changing, and uh, it's hard it's hard to predict when a flood will come or not. But the 100-year floodplain is primarily the area where 
the attention is given for homes that are either existing or they're trying to build in these uh, floodplains that the public needs to be aware of. Great, thank you for the overview on that. Um, again, I guess it's not my place to say, but that seems pretty straightforward. Um, and uh, Blas, maybe I would just ask, is it uh, possible that you might be able to review and update that recommendation by Wednesday, as I know that that's the deadline that- Absolutely. Great. No, I will. I will do that. I will. Do, I will update it and read the recommendations. Great. Thank you. Um, and then, um, sorry, I'm bouncing around a little bit here. I guess we're going to work from the bottom up. Um, Lynette, would you um, like to speak to the water conservation recommendation as well as the plans to incorporate feedback from um, the task force and staff? Yes, I can do that. Yes, you can work on um, doing the updates by Wednesday. Is that what you were saying yes to? Yes. Okay. And um, do you want to give us an overview of the recommendation as it's currently written? Um, I, I'm I'm not available to really look at it right now, but um, so I'm not in a very good place to be able to say anything. I'm okay. I'm out uh, doing some. Things. I'm we just had another. I had another commitment that I had to do, so I'm not in a place to say anything. And if somebody else can go over it, that would be better. Would you like me to go through that? Yeah, that would be great. Okay. The idea was to uh, reduce water use. Um, we know that as climate change occurs, we will have probably flooding because we'll have um, uh, those big rainstorms, but we'll very likely, uh, we're, we're likely to become more drought. Um, more drought days than not. So the idea is to uh, begin to reduce water use. And that's through, um, and we probably need to fix that date, Lynette, that would be one thing. Um, and that's through different uh, education policy projects, uh, resources, and this would be both indoor and outdoor. So um, of course, uh, zero scaping on new construction um, hopefully we can get rid of some of the uh, HOA uh, pieces where they make you have a green lawn and be able to use um, um, more uh, zero scaping. Um, go to more native vegetation in parks and open spaces. It should also reduce mowing and some of those things that I see them doing at our little local park down the street from me. Um, uh, offer support for zero scaping. There's already some of that through uh, can water uh, through Resource Central. They have some nice plans, so I think we could add on there. And then uh, just increasing uh, awareness and promotional event. And then again, uh, create uh, HOA and city or ordinances to promote zero scaping and uh, drought tolerant, uh, drought resistant gardening. Thanks, Karen. Any clarifying questions for this one? Um, regarding public health, Karen, could you give us, um, we kind of jumped into the logistics of rounding out the recommendations. Um, and on that one, I would, um, I would like you to present the recommendation, but I would also um, if you haven't already, I, I could use a, an updated text copy of the recommendation, uh, which I think there was some email correspondence back and forth about the changes, but it would be helpful if you could draft the language inside of the body of the document for that. Would that be achievable? By I, get so con I am so confused with how many documents we have. We yeah. have three, and you know, there's three attached and then there's two more the next day. If you yeah. will 
show me which document it needs to go in, I will yes. update it. I would be happy to send you one single document <laughs> okay. for okay. you to add your comments to. And, and we realize on that front that um, it's been a lot and we have tried really hard to make it straightforward and there, I just don't think there's a way to do that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm, I'm a retired ICU nurse, right? And we have <laughs> algorithms. Do you do this? And then you do right? this. And if there's this system, you do this. This this going back and forth to five documents, I can't keep track of it. So it's my mind. And my day. Okay, thank you. Very you. Yep, happy, <laughs> happy to be of support in any way that we can. It's, you know, we all have different thought processes and, and this one is... Um, um, not, it doesn't follow my learning needs, <laughs> and I do have a lot of learning needs. Okay. <laughs> well, thank so, you for uh, tolerating, to all of you, thank you for tolerating the process <laughs> and, and doing your best to keep up with it. Yeah, that. yeah, okay. Um, the thought behind this is that as we, um, as we warm, that we will have um, a, a, a lot of very hot days. And if we think about our community, a lot of our low income housing might not have air conditioning and um, also the homeless population will be very much at risk with uh, heat waves and then also just other severe weather events, those huge rainstorms and such. So as we warm, we will also have more forest fires and uh, we'll have air quality issues. And um, as you have that, then you have other health issues. So we really need to have a system ready and in place to, um, to have uh, cooling um, areas. So if it's really hot that maybe fire hydrants are turned on, that, that we have ways for those people who don't have air conditioning to be able to, um, to cool. And if you you know, if you followed uh, our history person will tell you, Peter, that um, uh, there are uh, issues that occur throughout the world where they'll have a heat and, and, and um, tens of people will die just from the heat. So we need a way to do that. One of the main ways we wanted to do that is, is to have a coalition between uh, cities and, and health departments and the state health department to bring forward good ideas and also to be able to uh, rapidly identify when we need to implement certain issues and also to detect if our communities start having severe um, health issues as related to this. We will also have an increase in disease that we're not used to, <laughs> other than the coronavirus, disease that we're not resistant to. So, um, say Zika and uh, Chikanunga and all sorts of fun things that um, we'll be able to grow in our climate as it warms. So um, just to uh, be able to surveil that. That's the idea behind this. Thank you, Karen. And they now have a good, uh, they've been working together well, so they'll just need to stay working. Any clarifying questions? Okay, um, so we are going to attempt to do um, our voting and um, again, we're going to, um, you know, it's, it's important to speak up if you do have some serious reservations. Um, it's also important to understand that, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in terms of governance, that, you know, we understand that these are preliminary recommendations and that in almost every case there will be additional planning, work, resources, and efforts made um, to adopt the recommendations um, over time and that that will be the responsibility of um, a, a governing group or body to, to manage. So, um, so we want to have the right amount of discernment and, and detail and that's somewhere in the middle. 
Um, so not just the intent, but we want to, and, and not every single detail do you need to agree with, but sort of in that middle level of both the intent and the ideas as they're, they're written and presented, um, is it something that you as a task force member are comfortable putting forward as a recommendation to Longmont City Council? So with that, we're going to start at the top. Um, and we're going to, again, it's, it's seven o'clock, so we're halfway through our time. Um, it took us about 40 minutes to go through each of these. Um, so what I might do initially is just to get a straw vote and see if there are any hot um, recommendations that we need to come back to um, where there is uh, a degree of, of um, concern in the group. Uh, and before we do that, I do have, I want to go back to the question and Francie, maybe you can help me with this. I know we have Lynette and Joni on the phone. Um, I think there's one other person on the phone. We also have Andy on the phone, but Andy is not a voting member. Um, so he will not be participating in the voting. Um, Josie, I also had a quick clarification question for you. Uh, Lisa and I had two quick staff comments, and I just wanted to see if you wanted us to do this before the straw vote or after the straw vote. Um, two comments on different recommendations? Yes. Okay. I think we should, um, which two are those? Um, extending agriculture, zoning, and water conservation. I think we should address those um, before the vote. I think there's um, something to be said there um, that may affect people's decision. Um, and just to note that we could have a couple of potential outcomes. Um, so just to, um, we may have, uh, particularly with the resiliency group, it may be, um, Sort of a conditional approval if you will so meaning that the, there are updates that have been made so we can have approval conditional approval um and maybe something that either that needs more conversation before the task force is willing to get there and i don't know that we've ever um last round was really easy and maybe this round will be too um last round we had pretty much universal you know thumbs up or mostly up <laughs> um, on, on these recommendations. Um, should we run into there being um, something in this round uh, that doesn't garner that, we may have to talk a little bit more about how to address that, but we may have uh, a category of needs for their work if there's some contention there. Um, so we are trying to work towards consensus, but um, that shouldn't stop anyone from uh, sharing their their reservations. Yes, Karen. Oh, uh, Francie. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Did uh, on on the uh, staff recommendations are these new ones since the last review? Because I did incorporate two staff recommendations into extending agricultural zoning. Um, it was the for extending agricultural zoning. It was that one is actually was more of a clarification on code and HOAs, um, and less of a staff recommendation and and then the the water conservation was more more I wanted to check in with Lynette a little bit about her about updating that one okay. and I can go into that I, I want to follow when I should go into that with Josie um, well let's go ahead and go there since I happen to be the first one and we're there so um, Francie could you share with us the, um, the staff comment that you'd like to add? Sure, and um, I think Lisa was gonna do this one, so I'll let her do it. Yeah, I'll jump in on that one. So I did just wanna clarify, we had some folks from planning review that the ag recommend recommendation, and they, they did not think it required a code change in terms of allowing agriculture itself. So agriculture production is already a use by right in all of our zones. So you don't need to ask any permission. There's no code restrictions that prohibit people from doing that. 
and we can't actually regulate what HOAs do because they're a separate entity from the city. So we can't recommend a code change regarding regulating HOAs. That is something that I believe can happen on the state level because there are some state level regulations around HOAs not being able to ban things like their gardening and that kind of stuff. Um, so they didn't feel that that did require a code change uh, and did suggest that maybe revising the focus to be on the ability to market like retail produce and things like that. That is something that we would have to look at. Our code doesn't necessarily allow for that currently for people to sell produce to, you know, local markets and stuff from, from their home gardens. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear with the group um, so that you guys can decide if and how you need to revise that recommendation. It, um, there was some confusion as to whether it had to be a state preemption um, to, uh, you know, I believe the deal is that HOAs can make uh, requirements more stringent, but they can't make them less stringent. Um, and so there's a, a question as to whether to, uh, I mean, clearly, if we want to allow uh, extensive internal agriculture, the state could do that. Um, but uh, if it could become the minimum for the city as well, I'm I'm not sure that the, that the HOAs could could prevent could prevent that either. Um, so we need we need to discuss that. Um, but I do think that all of the stuff about um, creating markets and so on is already in there. Um, not necessarily as to whether it needed to be, you know, uh, how it would need to be detailed in terms of the code, but, but the fact that the infrastructure needs to be created is in there. I, I think so. I think they were more looking at because the title of the recommendation itself was extending agricultural zoning. Um, so I think that was what kind of flagged that. So it, it might be, and it's up to you guys how you want to change it, but changing the title to reflect kind of what we had just talked about. And then there can be content in the recommendation itself around those other pieces that need to be clarified or explored more. Josie, I just want to make sure you're aware that you're sharing your email right now. I was trying to look up a comment from Amy uh, that she had submitted on this, and I think she dropped off of the call. Um, so I was looking to see if I might um, share that with the group. Um, but this was the one. I'll share a comment from Amy. Based on my own research into agricultural economics, it's unlikely that a black backyard plot would be profitable for the vast majority of households. There's a real risk that people's expectations don't match the reality that they feel like the city's program, and that they may feel like the city's program would be misleading. Um, but she uh, said that she would recommend asking the group to either eliminate or uh, alter this recommendation. So without going into um, the details of her comment, I think it's fair to say that um, from a voting perspective, um, that comment indicates something below a 50%, you know, with Lois on neutral to, you know, pretty, pretty shaky towards down um, comment. Um, so it sounds like at minimum, um, well, so, so I think that we want to um, maybe look first at um, 
if the group feels like the uh, recommendation should be adopted as it stands um, or if it should be contingent upon uh, some modifications based on the feedback from um, staff around the use of the word zoning and the legality around HOAs. Um, so that might be a contingent approval um, or if there are others who share uh, a, a concern about the recommendation at large. Um, so with that, um, we will take a visual poll from those of you who are on um, on video and then we have um, Joni and Lynette that we can hear from um, individually. So um, if you would like to, um, let's just do actually just a, just a straight up vote, not thumbs up, middle or down, but if you'd like to vote on approving the recommendation as it stands, um, let's do the first round of hands for that. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then Lynette and Joni. Yeah, this is Lynette. I'm a, I'm in favor. Okay, Joni. Yes, this is in, I'm this is Joni. I'm in favor as well. Thanks. Okay, so that would be nine in favor for the recommendation as it's written. Um, and then Hi. go ahead, Marcia. Oh, I was just going to say, if it's a matter of comfort for things like uh, uh, t taking zoning out of the title, I'm certainly happy to do that, especially since everybody else seems to be pretty favorable about it. I think Amy's comment was a misreading in that it doesn't make promises of profitability. Okay. Um. Okay, so then the next group would be um, that you're comfortable with approving this recommendation conditional on the changes around the language regarding zoning um, or HOAs. I think were the two main recommendations with an emphasis there. Lisa, did Sorry, you I meant to vote for this one. Oh, <laughs> well, it's okay because I didn't count you in the last okay. round. Okay, hold on, hold on. You all can only vote one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. I thought the other piece was like a process question, not specific. I got it now. I'm good. <laughs> okay. Let me, all right. Scrap, so uh, Francie and Helen, I know you're both taking notes. Um, scrap all votes so far. We're going to start at the bottom, work our way up. Is anyone opposed to this recommendation um, in most any way, shape, or form? Okay, seeing none, um, the next option, and you only get to vote for one of the following two options, <laughs> would be you will approve it with some changes around language regarding zoning and HOAs to increase the focus on um, marketing and marketability. Um, so that would be the conditional approval, so approved with some modifications, um, so that group a show of hands if that's your first preferred option. So I see three. Michelle, yes? No, where are you at? I can't hear you. Just because I voted for the last one. So can't. You voted that it, you voted no on it. I voted yes. Okay, so in the middle we have two, Lisa and Phil. Okay, and then the recommendation as it stands, I assume is the rest of you. I'm not voting. I'm just showing you. Raise your hand. <laughs> okay. One, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then we heard from Joni and Lynette. That'd be seven, eight. Bloss, did you vote? Uh, you're muted. Are we okay? What portion of this are we talking about again? <laughs> okay, um, this option is to wholesale um, accept the recommendation as written, or to accept it with amendments. 
which is your preference? Um, as, as written. Okay. All right. So we have then, Francie, is that nine as written and two with amendments? Is your count the same? Okay. Okay. Um, moving on to residential and commercial composting. Are there any opposed? Um, any that believe this needs recommendations or uh, modifications of your first choice? Okay, and then uh, I assume all in favor is everyone of, as written. So then, Francie, that's 11, right? Okay. Um, downtown pay for parking. Opposed? With modifications? One, two, okay, two with modifications and approve as written. Would be the other nine, I assume. Um, Lynette and Joni, you'll have to um, speak up if uh, I'm assuming I'm assuming you will let me know if you are um, opposed or with modifications and otherwise I will assume yeah. you are with as written. Okay. Yeah, this is Lynette. Yeah. Agreed. This is Joni. Thanks. Yep. Um, education and outreach, comprehensive workforce development. Opposed? With amendments in favor. Okay, so that one would be unanimous at 11. Big picture climate lecture series. Opposed? With amendments. Bill, can you state what that amendment, I should have probably done this before, can you state what amendment you would like that to be? Just, I was just concerned with this one because I'm not sure how it reaches out to the entire public, except it offers, it offers people to come, but it seems to be addressing one aspect of the public that is very much, um, you know, about understanding climate, people that already understand climate change. I feel like mm -hmm. unless this has more language about being more inclusive about all different views, it's going to really just kind of be on one side. And this is kind of one of my questions that I brought up early, early on when we were meeting is, how are we gonna get all the different sides to start talking about this? There's, that's, that's my issue. Thank you. Um, and then all in favor, and we will note that and that will get included. Um, all in favor of this uh, recommendation as written. I assume that's everyone else, so that would be 10. Um, can we go back to um, downtown pay for parking? I think Lisa and Karen said with amendments, would you please uh, share with us what those are? I think some of it was discussed, but I didn't see it in there. And that is, um, um, sort of some sort of concept of that shuttle type thing, not having to get on the regular bus, but some sort of shuttle from areas to um, help those people who don't want to bike or walk downtown, um, which would still, you know, maybe um, allow a little, little less uh, parking on, on me. So just to flesh that out would be my yeah uh, Karen is it possible that you read the original that circulated and not the amended one because we did put a lot in there about that okay I'd need to go back it's it's been a while a long while <laughs> well and then there were like 300 documents to look at so <laughs> yeah, that's right <laughs> you know me <laughs> um okay so it sounds like um from the from the subgroup though that there were significant changes to that one to include a shuttle recommendation so it sounds like um, that that may be in there Lisa can you tell us what your um, conditional approval would be yeah I think that we I think this maybe was discussed a little bit also but a little bit deeper dive into the potential um, 
negative impacts from an equity perspective because I, I wasn't part of this group, but I remember that this was something that was discussed pretty in depth with Just Transition Plan Committee and just wanting to make sure that those questions or concerns are, are really addressed on a, on a root level or at least acknowledge that, that there might be some deeper analysis that might need to be done on that side of things. Great, thank you for clarifying. Um, and I think we are pretty clear on the extended agricultural zoning that the reservations there were to um, take the word zoning out as the zoning requirements did not feel like they were needed by um, staff as well as um, maybe some kind of caveat around um, according to what is legally permissible for HOAs at the state level and that it's just outside of the jurisdiction of the city to regulate HOAs. So maybe that becomes more of a statewide petition to toward HOAs or something like that. Okay, okay sorry, thanks for um, bearing with us as we um, build the plane while we're flying it a little bit here, but I think we're getting there. Um, okay, so the newspaper article series, um, any opposed? Uh, approve. What, which one is it again? I'm sorry. The newspaper article series. Oh. Okay. Um, approve with amendments. Michelle and Marsha. Okay, and then, so that would be two, and then, um, so that's, and then I assume nine approved. So then let's hear what the, oh, and. Sorry, and it looks like there's a couple, there's a little more discussion. Um, so let's go, and you're muted. This is Peter. I'd be glad to add the suggestion about the Longmont leader, if that's, uh, and I don't, I'll take a look at it. But yeah. Um, it wouldn't but, change the nature of right, it. Right, wouldn't change the nature, and that's exactly right. right. And my suggestion was gonna be right, not to name the the platform at all. Okay. Right? Don't say the time's call. Don't say the leader. We don't know what's going to happen. It'll probably be okay. a year and a half before we get there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I'm I'm in full agreement with um, with the recommendation as written. Okay. So you don't have any conditions that you're wishing to. None. Address. Zero conditions. <laughs> okay. So it sounds like um, the conditions on this one to make it unanimous would just be to non-specify the outlet, but to keep the overall mm -hmm. intent. Right. Of the, okay. okay, and Michelle, did that capture? I, yeah, that's just what I was gonna say. That, um, maybe just mentioning something, articles online as well as not, not just in the physical newspaper, but they're online. Can we just, can we just remove the word newspaper? I mean, Say that, newsroom. Yeah. Or article series or. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's a good idea. To remove it from the heading. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. I'm going to keep us moving. Um, so the Longmont exhibit, um, anyone opposed with conditions? Prove is written. It'd be unanimous. Okay. Great, thank you. Community Sustainability Liaison Program. Um, disapprove. Approve with conditions. Approve as written would be unanimous then. Yep. Great. Okay, and then uh, resilience and adaptation. Um, disapprove. Approve with modifications. And then that would be unanimous. Are you talking about the health one specifically, yeah. Josie? Yes, I'm so sorry. Um, let me clarify uh, just in case uh, that was confusing for anyone. So the public health um, to create a climate adaptation and health plan um, coalition. Um, so anyone opposed? Does anyone have a conditional approval of this recommendation? Okay, and then that would be unanimous. Water conservation. Uh, Francie, I believe you said there was a staff comment on this one before voting. 
Yes, and I'm. this is also partially a comment to Lynette, since it sounds like you have limited capacity at this time, and there are significant staff concerns, uh, specifically around a, uh, a goal of 50% water reduction in five years for parks and golf courses. So not all, it was as written was not all city water, but specifically parks and golf courses. Um, so um, the, the main concern for that was it would significantly change what our parks and golf courses look like. So it, and it would also be very expensive. Um, so I just wanted um, I just want to make sure that um, there is time over the next two days for you to look through all those comments and wanted to see, put out a request to see and ask you, do you want someone to, um, else maybe from your subgroup to work with you on that if you have limited capacity since there were um, significant staff comments on that recommendation? I'm able to look at those. That that would be okay, okay. for me to look at them. Um, I just... Um, I just will think that they're going to be cutting this back whether they want to or not. So, you know, <laughs> they better be, they should start thinking about it because we're going to be out of water. The windy gap is not going to happen or we're poisoning our water at Union Reservoir right now with fracking, but we're not going to have water. So they're going to have to think of what are they going to do? Um, you know, they should have a plan for what they're going to do when there's no water because there's not going to be water for these things. So I know what they're saying. I know what they're saying. It's, it is going to be, it is going to look very different and probably in five years, but maybe we should either extend it out to 10 years or, or change the percentages some that would be, you know, but I'll be happy to look at them. Thank you. And I, I'd also just ask if you don't mind uh, expanding the financial summary section of that recommendation as well. When you say expanding, what do you mean? Um, I believe as written, it said, the cost of doing these programs would be pretty minimal. And um, I put some estimate cost of land transitions in there. So I, I'm, I'm not- Estimate cost of what? Um, the, the cost of producing by 50%. Um, if, if, you uh -huh. don't, if, if that is the goal, if uh, you don't mind expanding on the, the fine kind of the financial cost section of that recommendation. Uh, but I don't, I don't really know. I'm a lay person. I don't really know how much that's going to cost. So what, do you uh, want me the, to come in, up with some numbers? In the comments, I, I provided uh, a couple, I provided a example cost of transitioning one acre of land to uh, a turf grass that would reduce by 50% 50, 50 as a, an example for you to build off of. So, um, yeah, so let me let me try to help out here. It sounds like um, that one that there is um, that there's some a little bit of work to do, um, and that Lynette Francie is is ready to be there right by your side to help um, to help move through that in any way possible. Um, sure. I think, so I think that, but it sounds like there is. Um, that there are some real sort of modifications and adjustments that need to be considered. Um, so what I would like to suggest for this one, based on the conversation, and feel free to disagree with me if uh, you think that's the thing to do, um, I would like to have uh, just two options for this one, which would be to um, either oppose or to have sort of a conditional approval where um, Francie and Lynette and whomever else is interested are able to work through the, the comments that were made since it sounds like there's a, a fair amount of unresolved uh, questions at this point. Does that- okay. So I think I think um, an approving vote at this point would be the intention of addressing water, water shortages, and water conservation, both indoor and outdoor, um, and that that is at the heart of this recommendation. Um, and then 
looking to come up with an updated recommendation that um, that Lynette and Francie and whomever else wishes to participate in that feel feel comfortable with. Okay. Um, I'm not quite sure what those conditions were that you were setting are exactly, Josie. Um, there are a couple of things that Lynette stated at foregone conclusions that are in fact only risks um, in terms of the completion of the Windy Gap firming project and the poisoning of Union Reservoir. Um, we have some pretty, well, I don't know what, what, how to put odds on Windy Gap, but, the, but in terms of the uh, poisoning of Union Reservoir, we have some pretty serious monitoring going on there. And use of water from Union Reservoir is not in the city's water plan at all. So, um, you know, I, I think that, that a recommendation this dramatic needs to, well, I'm a fan of dramatic conservation recommendations in general, um, it, it, it needs to be some kind of a, of a contingency plan um, because in, in addition to the high costs that Francie was talking about, there's also a significant revenue loss um, associated with doing some of these things. So it needs a lot more planning if it's gonna be adopted. Can I ask a question? I, I have um, um, just, as you were looking at this Francie, did you look at there's a cost right now to be using all of the water. And so as we yeah. have less water, the cost of water becomes more dear. And so how do we, how do we um, balance that, that yes, it might cost money to replace the turf grass, but we won't be using all of the water, which is a cost, uh, particularly in a, mm -hmm. in a drought environment. And so I think, I think that also needs to be considered. And, and I will just say that um, the stamp well is leaking by the reservoir right now and we can monitor, but by that time it's already polluted. So um, just a thought. So is well, anyone else interested, we, we're not gonna resolve this tonight, friends, um, but is anyone else interested in participating in that understanding that we have a very tight turnaround we need to you know really within the next 48 hours or so um so karen would like to be engaged in that as well um anyone anyone else okay um so is anyone opposed to this recommendation wholesale Bill and Marcia. Okay. Um, conditional approval in this case would mean, um, and I realize this isn't as clear cut as some of the others, um, but it would mean going through staff comments and task force comments and reconciling them in a way that keeps the intention of the recommendation, which is to address water and resiliency for the city in face of climate change, um, and to hopefully come up with an amicable recommendation that is a combination between um, staff and task force um, to move forward with. So I realize that's not quite as clean as the others where it's like change this and this and we're good. Um, but it's sort of with the belief that the intention is that the task force and staff can work together to find a recommendation that meets the spirit of addressing water, potential water shortages due to climate change. And I think that, again, I, um, I guess it's probably not my place to do this. So a conditional approval show of hands. One, two, three, four, five. Did I get that all? One, two, three. yep, okay. Um, and then is there anyone who would like to approve this um, recommendation as written? Anne and Michelle, Joni, Lynette, 
where do you stand on this one? <coughs> okay, and Michelle, you can put your hands down. Okay. I, I thought we were only uh, given two options this okay, time, so and you me, just gave us three. I did. I keep changing the rules. I'm a terrible, <laughs> terrible facilitator, and I'll go to detention after this. Um, okay, so I, I went back on my own word, and I said, I can't do that. That's not my call to make, <laughs> um, and that didn't seem fair. There are those who believe the recommendation should be adopted as written. Um, it, so um, so let's, let's start again. Um, clear the slate one more time. Okay, opposed to the recommendation. One Could I clarify th something? Yeah. Um, the water rights don't work the way the assumption is said. You know, Longmont has water rights. They may not turn into water at some point in the future, but until they do, they don't cost us any more than we're already paying. Um, or we have an agreement that costs us a fixed fee. So um, it's not like, you know, your water meter at home where the more you use, the more you pay. Um, so I'm just saying the math doesn't work on, on these assumptions before we vote. Okay. Great. And but so water is increasing. It's always increasing. The price of water is always increasing because there's a shortage. No. <laughs> I mean, if we run, if we, if we need to go obtain new water rights, then that is a fairly reasonable assumption. But if this is water rights that we already own, um, then it's not a reasonable assumption. They're ours and, and whether they run dry or not is the only question. It's not how much we have to pay for them. Their, their price isn't gonna go up. And I think that's part of what this is talking about is right now, we're getting water from the Western Slope and, and they're predicted to be in a total drought. So we have junior water rights. And so it's going to be very difficult to continue to get water over here. I think there's a lawsuit about that even. Yeah. And can I just jump in? What I'll do is I, I know a little bit about water rights, but I'm not as knowledgeable as Ken Hewson. So I will try to see if he can join us on the call. To, to provide some history and answer some of those questions of where we are with our water rights. But I know we have a PAC schedule today, so um, we can talk about that and I'll see if Ken can join us on the call, Karen and Lynette. And I okay, think it's thank fair you. To, sorry to interrupt you, Lynette. I think it's fair to say we don't have a quorum on this recommendation um, in approval of it. So we need, so I think that um, I would like to propose, especially given the time and the remainder of the agenda, that um, that this one is going to have some more work and we'll bring it back to the task force and um, we'll consider that at the last, um, at the last meeting or we'll figure out a, okay. another plan. Okay. Thank you, Lynette, for your uh, your openness to the um, to the input and feedback from the group. No, you're welcome. I'll be glad to read through it tomorrow. Great, thank you. Um, and then the last one on our list for tonight is um, the flooding mitigation and preparedness education. So again, primarily a public awareness campaign around flood risk. Um, anyone opposed? Uh, any conditional approvals? Bill, would you like to state your conditions? Just that I think we do a lot of this already. This kind of goes back to the zoning issue where we already do a lot of this effort and we already, um, you know, any builder that comes in is made fully aware of the floodplain issues and the, where the floodplain is. Um, the only thing I was thinking of, just, I don't know if it's worth writing in there, but combining it with the recommendation of the like community liaison one. And, um, I don't know if that's just like, un, doesn't need to be said. Yeah. So it might, that might not make or break your approval of the recommendation, but you'd like to add it as a comment and Gloss already 
then he'll take the comments that have been given uh, and maybe you can include that one as well, Blas. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, and then, uh, so that would be one, um, one kind of additional um, approval and then uh, 10, 10 approved. Okay, great. Well, um, I'll take a moment just to thank all of you for the, um, for the work and effort um, and, and for, you know, following up with these. I know this work was challenging to begin with and uh, the new sort of remote environment for everything has certainly presented new challenges um, along with the additional and changing workloads and home lives and all of that. So thank you all for the efforts that you've put in um, to making this happen. Um, so uh, how do I stop my screen share? All I have is an option to share, but not, that's so weird. Ah, here we go. Gosh, you'd think I'd be good at this by now. Um, given the timing um, today, I think that we can fairly readily push the presentation conversation until next time. Um, in the interim, we could certainly um, distribute that. We've already distri distributed the round one recommendations and there's a sort of template there, um, but I think we'll need a little bit additional conversation about that. Um, and you all between now and the next meeting will receive uh, the draft report so um, and have some opportunity to feedback on that. Is there any, and we'll go through the dates um, here at the very end, so we do want to reserve five minutes for that. But I'd like to see if for the next um, 10 minutes or so, we're able to have a conversation about governance. Um, because that one does need to go into the report, which we are working on sort of compiling all the work that you've done and um, the work that IBE has done around outreach and the questionnaire um, and sort of the general overview. So you all will get that here soon. Um, but one of the big outstanding um, issues there is, um, is the governance recommendation. So Lisa, would you like to take a moment to um, to talk about the context for governance? Sure. So uh, before we jump into that conversation, so as Josie stated, I think at, toward the beginning, we part of what we need to discuss is how do we, how do we want to move forward after the report itself goes to council and what, what this group envisions being kind of the accountability mechanism for that. Um, to make sure that there are things happening once the report is done. And I just want to kind of provide some information on things that are already in place that we can tap into and then we'll kind of move into a discussion about what um, the thoughts of the group as a whole are. So uh, the first thing is that folks are probably pretty familiar with the fact that we have a sustainability advisory board. It's a formal advisory board. People go through an application process. They're appointed by council. They serve three-year terms. And their charge of that board is really all things sustainability. Um, the majority of their focus is the implementation of the sustainability plan, but any other big topics like this that come up really falls within their purview. And we do anticipate that whatever recommendations that are approved by council would then be in incorporated into the update of the sustainability plan when that happens, it was supposed to happen start happening this year, but that's gotten pushed off because of budget constraints. So I do want folks to know that there is, is that formal entity already in place and more or less serves that function. Um, there are two vacancies right now on that board. So that's definitely something that, you know, if, if folks are interested in applying for that, again, it's an application process um, and there are limited seats available. Uh, and then the other thing is that we do already do a quarterly um, report to council on, generally speaking, it's all been on hold, but um, that's a general update on sustainability as well. So that's something that we could also look, so that was something that was included in the resolution that was passed, the climate emergency resolution that included, sorry, there's a motorcycle going by, um, that also called for the convening of the Climate Action Task Force. So that's something that we can incorporate a climate action update into that existing quarterly report. 
And then we also have the Longmont Sustainability Coalition, which is a much more informal group that has folks from a couple different boards, uh, a lot of residents, folks from the business community, um, from the R Center, a couple different community groups um, that meets on a quarterly basis. We always do a sustainability update to that group too. And then usually we do a, a presentation or discussion on a specific topic that's timely in that period of time. So I just wanted folks to make sure, make sure folks knew that there, was, there were some things already in place before we have that governance conversation. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and let me expound, um, give me one sec, Marsha, and let me see if um, I, I get to what you're getting at or not. Um, so there's really, there's two different questions here. One is what is the formal ongoing governance for these recommendations? And the second is, what are your opportunities to continue to stay involved? And those two things are somewhat related to each other, but they are not the same. Um, the, so the best we could come up with, there are, um, there's a choice to either integrate the scope of the task force recommendations into the existing sustainability advisory board and or the coalition. Um, but let's just say that the, the Sustainability Advisory Board is the most formal governance group that is in existence that already has a purview that this could fit under. Or the recommendation from this group would be to form a new coalition or working group um, but we'd have to figure out what the distinction would be between the, that group and the existing sustainability advisory board, since there's already an existing group where this um, could fit under, we'd have to understand what the difference is. So there's an either or there. One second, Marcia. And then there's a third option, which is to and or. So the first one is either or. And then the, the third option is to and or form a technical advisory team that would be able to plug into specific recommendations with, um, you know, a little bit of uncertainty about exactly how that would be implemented. But the idea would be that there could be technical advisory team members that might be focused on specific recommendations um, that would either be supporting the Sustainability Advisory Board or the new working group or coalition. So with that, um, additional thoughts or clarifying questions. I just put this into text um, so people can, who are visual can visually see it. Josie, am I missing Thanks, anything? Um, I think this is a good starting point. And if you could blow it up a little bit more for folks, I think that would be helpful to you. Can you just make it fill your screen more? All right, Marcia, thanks for your patience. You're muted. Marcia, you're muted. You can't get unmuted. Can you, <laughs> you may need to either type in the chat your thoughts or uh, you may need to try logging out and logging back in. Uh, France, you could also, oh, okay. There I'm there unmuted. It, okay. My space bar would not unmute me. So okay. I don't know why it wouldn't. <laughs> okay. I think that we are um, in a state where we're making uh, assumptions without having definitions of what governance means. So let's walk through this a little bit. This is going to be presented to the council and the council will accept the whole report or we'll accept it one by recommendation by recommendation first which is it i don't think that that's actually been determined by council when in the resolution or when the climate action task force was established marcia so i don't think we have a specific answer to that okay um, so then given that, what is the definition of governance, Do, you know, assuming that you're going to uh, give ownership of these recommendations to some of these boards, in my observation, 
none of these boards ever actually implement anything. They just make recommendations or get reports and, and say, yes, the progress is good or the progress is bad. But when something like, oh, I don't know, to get outside the sustainability, uh, you know, Jody's um, Main Street Corridor land use plan, that work is done by the staff and, and by contractors and not by any of these volunteer organizations. Um, and, and so I'm not sh sure we have a definition of governance. Um, and I also believe, by the way, that because we're going to have, um, we're going to have a, a budget that's cut by 13 to 25%, depending on what happens in the next couple of, of uh, months at the most right now, if we want progress in the upcoming year um, to, to happen on any of these things, we are going to have to change the model for, um, for implementation, not just governance. And again, I still don't have a definition of governance, um, but I want to get it done. Um, if you follow both the industry literature on, on climate change and the industry of the just transition uh, to renewable energy and you know the, the big broad brush things, um, all the buzz is around, we have to have shovel ready projects like the day after the election. So we've got, um, we've got something that has to happen in the next, in the next eight months um, in order to win the recovery grants. You know, it's gonna be like 2009 again. And the ERA program really had problems because not enough people had shovel ready projects. So we need to be looking ahead and not just putting these into, uh, you know, a governance mode where somebody makes slow progress on recommendations by, uh, you know, what governance boards do, but, but rather, um, you know, talking about a next, next phase of the emergency. So at minimum, we need to understand what government's actu governance actually does. And, sec and second, we need to figure out how to get actual boots on the ground um, engineering and planning work done here on these projects. I mean, if we mean this, we need to figure out how to get it done in a city with no money. I just want to make two quick comments on that. And Mark, Mark is right, just to clarify the, the boards that are in existence other than, uh, well, the boards that are in existence and specifically the Sustainability Advisory Board are, they are advisory boards. That is, mm -hmm. they, they aren't, they don't do, you know, every once in a while we have volunteers that help with events and things like that. But I mean, that's kind of the extent that we go in terms of implementation. So I do want to make sure everybody understands how those boards function. And then with regards to your uh, stimulus comment, that's absolutely right. Those are the conversations that we are hearing as well. And we are having a lot of those conversations already internally and have our eye on when this report comes out from this group to be able to look at how are we prioritizing those recommendations to plug into the stimulus fund. So that, that those are already conversations that we are having internally with staff so that because we also see that is our primary opportunity to move any of this work forward given the budget constraints that we're going to be facing hopefully. And I, um, this is Ann Lutz and I just wanted to make a few comments too. I've had my um, top person in my group looking at grant opportunities and getting us set up at a base level so that we can jump in. We've had a number of projects I think that we're looking at um, that we feel we're getting, we're moving them into the shovel ready stage. Um, I went through the era time frame, and you know we were fortunate here in Longmont. We did get some good money out of that, and uh, I certainly intend to be poised for us to move ahead with that. So, and Hi. the fact that um, uh, Lisa's group has also hired a full time grant person, I think will be just um, it'll make a lot easier for us. So I, I think we're looking ahead to this time frame. But sure. I agree that that's not really the, 
what an, um, a board would be doing, mm -hmm. but something I see staff doing. Yeah, I wanted clarification I on what the, I, I know that uh, Kate, you do, Karen, um, that, that we I need to do what the, what the advisory board's role would be. So if, if I can try to help on this, I think that can I what add I, a couple comments? I, I've had my hand raised for a long oh, time. Can I add a, sorry, Karen. A, a couple comments? And I think it's important before we move beyond with this. When a group of us got together to write this uh, resolution, one of the main things we did and why we said we wanted a task force was that we wanted something that would be rapid that we would go out and treat this as an emergency, that it wouldn't be in a long term, um, you know, become part of the city bureaucracy and um, not be top of, uh, not be something that um, uh, was focused daily type of thing. We already have, um, I think it's been almost a year, maybe it has been a year since we did the the recommendation. Um, in, when you're facing an emergency, you're supposed to act rapidly. And so we need something that is going to be, oh, that helps, I can see everybody. We need some, some way of monitoring this and implementing this so that it's treated as an emergency, not something that gets put off because of, you know, the city, uh, budget or because this month we're focusing on businesses or whatever. It needs to be something, it needs to be in a place for governance where there's accountability to work on it rapidly because folks, this is coming in a hurry. Yeah. There's already towns on the coast that are going underwater. The weather, we've, we've possibly so, got the third so Karen, hurricane coming up, something rapid. Yes. So, so with that, and, and kind of the comments that you and Marcia have brought forward, um, what is it that you would like to recommend to council in terms of, so, and, and sort of around this notion of accountability, implementation, um, so, and, and the adaptation of the recommendations over time, right? Because, um, so, so that's, that's kind of what we're getting at, is what is this group's recommendation around accountability, implementation, and adaptation of the recommendations that are put forth? Yeah, I think what I would like to see is um, it, these recommendations sort of go over multiple places, as does the sustainability report. But the sustainability report, it has, or the uh, plan, I guess it would be, has so many, um, so many, you know, one, one A, one B type of thing, which is very nice and readable and you can see the plan. But how do we have this not part of that plan, but a separate plan that we're going to work on and look at and set, you know, we set goals of 2021 or 2022 but we can't wait until 2022 to start working on this. So whoever has this needs to develop the plans for implementation. You know, say, um, you know, and I'll give you an example of PRPA. We had a goal of 100% by 2030. Now, now there's a challenge out there. Well, let's reach 85%. I can't remember what the dates are, but 85% within the next three years. How are you going to get there? And so, you know, we need things like that that say um, an ability to work across all departments because this is water, this is uh, planning, this is electricity, this. This is transportation. So somebody that holds this, like Lisa does with the plan, but to be separate and to um, maybe so have more frequent reporting. So sorry, I'm trying to, to pull out the recommendation out of the things. Out of my mumbling, yes. <laughs> that you're speaking about. So is it that um, you, and, and we are coming up on time here, so I, I recognize that some people may need to drop off. Um, and I, we will try to wrap this up fairly quickly, but are you suggesting that there is a 
um, it's a staff position or person um, that it or and or um, again, just trying to get into the structural notions around accountability, implementation, and adaptation of these recommendations. Mm -hmm. What is the people structure that you believe is necessary to make that happen? Um, with the understanding that and this, this may be different in Longmont, um, but that forming new formal governance bodies through city processes are fairly time intensive and, and rather bureaucratic. No. Um, what I would like to see is somebody like Lisa, who has a position that sort of crosses all of these areas her plan does, but it not be part of the sustainability plan because then it gets bogged down in a huge plan. But a separate plan that is a climate emergency plan that then um, has accountability to the city, whatever, but also into the city council and to the residents and, and um, the boards and the coalition that um, Lisa mentioned are like informational boards. It goes back to the community, sort of a reporting structure or informational reporting but also to the city council. This was declared an emergency and then therefore the city should hear an update like every quarter on the climate emergency plan. Now isn't that something that could be done through city council? Yes, yes, a report to city council. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question about that because I like getting reports, but I also like there to be work done. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, what we have here, I mean, what we, we've already seen is, is that we had people who did a lot of work at the beginning, and now, you know, what we've got a third of the people here participating, and it was really hard for us to get that last bit of the work done. We are also, most of us, um, and I realize there are exceptions, but, but I would say at least half of the exceptions are are uh, already on the city staff and already have jobs full time. Um, uh, most of us are at the end of our ability to do engineering work uh, just when the engineering work begins. So, you know, we, this team is, is if we all stopped and made it our full time job, might be able to do a shovel ready plan inside the city context that could then be handed over to a grant team. Uh, and the progress on that could be um, reportable to either some oversight group. But otherwise, it, is, it, it either has to go through the city budget or we have to have a novel way of, of finding qualified labor to put these plans together. So Marcia, do you have a recommendation regarding accountability, implementation, and adaptation of the recommendations over Well, time? since you still haven't defined accountability or governance, I'm not sure I do. I think I could get skilled people at less cost than possibly other places because it is an emergency for some of these projects, but not for others. Um, but otherwise, uh, you know, again, that is way out of out of the box. Um, if it's so more if, of a technical advisory, like no, a not advisory at all. I'm talking about doing it. I'm talking about doing the work. Who's going to do the work? Because you either you you get a grant, but you have to have a proposal to get a grant, and these proposals are going to have to be good, which means that it takes people with the ability to actually do engineering planning um, in order to win the grants. Um, so how are we going to get those people given that the city is going to be, the city doesn't have money to, to assign people to doing those. Right. So, so it, you know, it's all very well to talk about governments, but governance, but how do you get it? How do we, how do we find the skills to actually make progress? Um, you know, I mean, so, I, so I'm trying to balance our, our time, which we are, we are over. 
um, which is which also a, a fairly complex conversation. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm hearing is some concern about folding this into existing structures, so existing staff responsibilities and existing um, governance boards, so like an oversight board is what the um, sustainability advisory board is, as I understand it, and then that reports to council. So that's the accountability there is essentially staff to council, but there is a group that is helping along the way. What I, what I think I'm hearing, and, and maybe, and correct me if I didn't quite couch that accurately, what I think I'm hearing is that there's some concern that that existing um, structure is either overtaxed and or doesn't move quickly enough to address the notion of the urgency that was presented. What's less clear to me is what the proposed alternative recommendation is. Um, so both, Josie, um, both of those are true. And I guess that's why I'm not sure why we think if we're going to get governance and accountability, we think we get anything. Because unless you've got somebody to do the work, nothing changes. Okay. I'd like to make a comment from Longmont Power and Communications and just speaking of my particular group. Um, I have staffed up by three people. I've got one person actively full-time engaged in benchmarking or commercial and we're ready to head that way. I think what I'm saying is that we need for city council when they hear these recommendations to say, we like commercial benchmarking, go for it. Get it done by this date. Okay, that gives us marching orders. Um, got another person working on residential home efficiency, another person working on commercial um, building uh, energy audits, um, retro commissioning. I mean, the, the things that we have put, put in at least our building report are things that are actionable and we are working on them still actively with or without COVID, with or without any other direction, because we want to be ready to go. We know these are critical. Right, and that's really good. And I think, I, I think that um, one way of approaching this in terms of accountability is exactly what Anne says, which is when the city council prioritizes these things, if that's what happens, then how fast can the staff on an emergency basis say, I can, uh, I can address this, this, and this on a fast track with the resources I have versus here are the priority things that I can't address without something. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can go around and say, how do we use our resources to um, maximize our, our grant revenue? Right. So, I would, so I would suggest so that that maybe we don't have to define this. I think that Harold and uh, the council can look at what recommendations are approved and decide, do we want to disseminate this and then I'll be responsible for gathering it back together in accountability. Um, I, I think that we don't have all the knowledge to know whether or not it should be here or there or everywhere. Well, and I think having Lisa in place as the sustainability coordinator, to me, I'm used to, I meet with her, say quarterly or more often, and we, we talk about what we're working on, if we're running into problems, okay, we've got some things to go, and it's largely, or in large part due to her leadership. I've got, I think we have new leadership within Longmont Power and Communication that has totally changed our direction. So um, let me, can, can I try to help us out here, especially given the, the hour? Yeah, um, it, it's okay. No, I, I, I appreciate the, the energy around this. It's a very important conversation. Um, and what I, what seems like might be a path forward would be to have an ad hoc group conversation to work through some of the details around this. 
Um, I think this may be of, of more um, interest and relevance to some than others. And then to be able to come back to the group with um, either a, an agreed upon path forward or a couple of alternatives for the group to, um, to discuss. And Karen, in, in the worst case, it may be um, that the group goes to council with some options around governance without a singular path forward and, and that becomes something for council to decide on. But I think we need an ad hoc offline conversation to move this forward a little bit further. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Is that amicable? Okay, so it seems like that needs to be Marsha and Karen and Lisa at minimum. Um, and we can put that out because there are groups those who aren't here off and there are a lot of folks that weren't able to join us tonight so we can put that call out and okay. um, schedule that in the does next couple of weeks. Okay, does anyone else that's currently on the call and we will do this for everyone else, but does anyone else um, want to participate in that? Phil? Okay. Phil um, would. Okay, Phil and Ann um, and Karen and Marsha and Lisa and I'm sure you'll be involved in some form or fashion. Maybe we'll see. I figure it out. Okay, um, you've, you've got you've got some work to do with the um, on on the water side and the report side. So you've got a pretty full yeah. plate right now as well. So maybe not Lisa or not Francie. Um, okay, so um, so I'm pretty sure though Francie will be maybe the one to follow up with that at least as an initial email. Um, or Lisa, would that be? It'll be one of us, yeah. Okay, all right, so so look for that. Um, I think that that should probably be its own distinct email, um, separate from kind of all the rest of the notes. So I'm again trying to get the right size for the, the bytes of information. So let's um, let's wrap up tonight with, um, with I think, um, three things that hopefully we can go through very quickly. Um, so we'd like to go through the schedule. Um, before we go through the schedule, uh, for for kind of wrapping up this work. Um, Francie wanted to talk to you all at least preliminarily about the just how and if the Just Transitions Committee might be a part of the presentation to council. Francie, can you? Sure. Um, so what what you all will see when we send out the draft report and Josie will send us share that date um, it's later this week is that we have we'll have the very close to final uh, report from the just transition plan committee we would like to ask that group if they would like to present um, to city council and we could either have them present with the climate action task force or we could have them come to city council at a separate time to present um, so before um, going to them to see their interest in presenting. I wanted to check with the Climate Action Task Force to see if you all would like them to co-present with you. Yes, Marsha. Um, I'm not sure what they are presenting. Are they presenting um, concerns with the Climate Action Plan or are they, planning, are they presenting a plan of their own on, about the just transition and and whenever I hear that, I always want to say from what to what. So if it's not the climate action plan, what is it? So it is specific recommendations about how to make, um, when implementing the climate action plans, how to really factor in equity. Um, they have a list of recommendations that really focus on um, how you can be as inclusive and equitable as possible when implementing these recommendations. So. It's not specifically concerns on the recommendations, but more, I would say it's kind of direction for staff or whoever is taking this implementation about how they can really make sure it's inclusive for all members of the community when implementing climate action. Above and beyond what has already been in our rubric to make sure that we consider that at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it might be good to have them as separate presentations. Um, I, I think the Climate Action Task Force has so, not that they're more important, but it's just 
we've got a lot of stuff in there that um, some of the concepts are fairly complex. And I think, um, I, I guess I don't, I don't want us fighting one, one team or one committee against the other, but I think the just transition plan will want to come in maybe at a following meeting and say, just Here to are our concerns. Yeah, here's our concerns. We've been working with the other team. So we've had some meetings and you know, um, understand some of the concepts, but um, just want to make sure don't, don't forget some of these important things that we're bringing. So, because otherwise I think it's going to be, it'll seem like a, it'll seem like a battle if we're, if we're doing both in the same meeting. I mean, the Climate Action Task Force, that's going to take a while to get through. And yeah. I do want to mention that we are planning, or it's going to city council tomorrow, but we're proposing going for two meetings to city council. Right, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I so who, who is presenting? Sorry, Ann, I didn't mean to jump on you, oh, but I did. Okay. <laughs> uh, we haven't asked the group that yet. Uh, we, we didn't want, uh, we wanted to first see um, if, if the, they might not even be interested in presenting to city council. So I don't know that yet, uh, but we wanted to see if at the end of the climate action presentation or wherever you, you would all like, do you want a just transition plan committee presentation to be designed how they would like to design it and maybe like given a time frame that's appropriate for city council or should their presentation be separate? Um, at a different meeting. Yeah, you asked a different, answered a different question that I asked. Who is giving the climate emergency task force presentation oh. tomorrow? Because oh no, it's not we a hadn't heard about it. No, 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 it's not a presentation it's tomorrow. Here. It's just an info item that's proposing that we present the climate action task force report over two separate sessions, June 30th and July 7th. Ah. Then in one session. Yeah. So it's yeah. just an info item going to council to say this, you know, based on the meeting we had a couple weeks ago with this group where Marsha, you'd brought up, this is, this is a lot of substantive information and recommended that we split that up over two presentations. So uh -huh. no presentation tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And just to, just to, to clarify, we, we are planning to incorporate the recommendations from the just transition plan committee into an appendix of the climate action task force. Again, we have been talking about equity throughout this entire process, and we do want to make sure that, that that is prioritized and that does stay part of the conversation in whatever way that it happens moving forward. Um, yeah. So this joint presentation uh, could be part of that, making sure that as we move forward into the implementation piece, that that piece needs to stay part of the conversation seems to me that the task force has been pretty attentive to all those suggestions. They've co-met with them. They've written that uh, the equity dimension into almost every proposal. And this seems to me like a diplomatic issue. I would, I would really want to see a strong endorsement from them, and not a public situation where they're saying, Gosh, these people didn't even try. We got to go off and do something else. Yeah, let's let's clarify that. That's not the that's not the nature of their recommendations, and that's not the nature okay. of the comments. Really, what they've developed is their own in their own voice and with their own experience. This is how to be inclusive. This is how to be how to bring equity forward as you move through implementation. It is not a critique of each of the recommendations from an equity perspective. Rather, it's saying, this is how to think about equity as you move through time from their own voice. So, so I wanna be really clear about the nature of recommendations that they're making. It's not a critique of this group's work. It's their own work in saying this is how to use an equity lens as you address climate change and other city issues. I mean, to me, a sign of their terrific work has been the way in which they've pushed the task force to be attentive. And I think that's been terrific. I agree with Peter. 
I and think very, that there, yeah. yeah, so so I, 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 that is valuable and the ways that it's been integrated into this work are valuable. My understanding is that this group also existed prior to and is independent of the climate action resolution. These two things just happen to coincide together. So they have their own work that they are doing to bring forward issues around equity, which I think um, as the um, current state of affairs in this country highlight are far from resolved. And this is your community's voice saying, this is how we can be a part of your decision making and the evolution of our community and our society as we move forward. And I think what's special about that is that it's in their voice from their lived experience and it's their way of sharing from where I'm sitting in this community, this is how to include us in the work you're doing. Um, and it's a more broad recommendation. It's not about just about climate, um, but as, as Karen was saying, these are the communities that tend to be most impacted by climate change, um, most readily and, most, and, and by COVID. Um, they are by definition the most vulnerable populations within the community and there are, this is their chance to say this is how from our perspective we can be included um, so, that's, think, so, so yeah. it's not a critique I think that hearing that it makes me think that in order to fully be heard for that team to fully be heard it would be best if they had their own time rather than an adjunct to ours that yeah. give them as much of a voice um i don't think as if they had their separate separate time and can describe then based on what the work that we've done how important it is to their communities uh, to be included and to be heard and uh, to be looked after in some ways, you know, like with air conditioning. Yeah, I agree with Karen that they need their own thing. I also think uh, from the point of view of the council, um, you know, the council it knows exactly how the Climate Action Task Force came into being. The climate does not have much idea, the, the council does not have much idea at all where the Just Transition team came from. So it would be great to have uh, some history on that in their presentation. Okay, so again, um, doing my best to move us through this and we're, we're dropping off like flies here. Um, but what I think I'm hearing is the desire to, or the recommendation from this group to give, um, to give the Just Transitions Planning Committee their own time and space with council to, to share um, their work, uh, should they be so inclined to do that. Okay, um, very last thing, and this will go in an email, um, but just so that you all can see that we've talked about it, and for those of you who need to hear it too, um, by the end of this week, we'll be sending the final draft of the report um, and the presentations to the Climate Action Task Force for your review. Um, final presentations for round one um, and round two are due on the 11th, which is, um, I was trying to pull up a calendar here. So that would be towards the end of, of next week. Those are pretty straightforward. It's basically that, um, that recommendation that's in bold off of the SMART Goals worksheet. Um, so it's basically that summary, um, but if you would like to um, make any changes to those or additions to them, we'll have our final meeting on the 11th. We'll talk more about the presentation at that time. Um, that will be again on the same platform. Um, and then the full report um, will be sent to um, Oh, so then the final report will be sent to staff on the 14th, so you all get a chance to look at it, um, and then we'll continue to make revisions, send it to staff on the 14th, 
Um, it'll be submitted to council on the 18th. Um, and then as Lisa was talking about, um, there are recommendations in two parts is what, they're, what we're currently hoping for per our previous conversation. So we'll present the first half on the 30th and the second half on the 7th, uh, just to not overwhelm completely with information since there's so much. And just to clarify, as I said a minute ago, that's, that proposal is going to council tomorrow night. So there's a, there's a chance that could change. I just wanna <laughs> make sure that's the that, yeah. folks if, if mm -hmm. a question or concern comes so, up. So, so the council is supposed to make a uh, a recommendation based on the contents of essentially the one paragraph of, of the SMART goals? They will get all of it. So they will get the full report that has the summary. It will have the full recommendations as they're written and submitted to us in final form. It will also include the outreach uh, questionnaire outcomes and reporting as well as um, the Just Transition recommendations and an appendices. So it will, um, it will be a full, there'll be a full report that council will receive, um, not just the summary recommendation. I thought we just decided that we would make the just transition a separate document rather than appendix. It is, a, so I thought what we just decided was that it would be a separate presentation, but that the that the comments around it, particularly because of the connection between climate and equity, um, that those recommendations would be included. It is a standalone report, but it would be included as an appendix in this report as well. And you'll have a chance to look at that um, starting on Friday of this week. So for now, could we um, include it? And then, then if there's a conversation about a desire to take that out of the appendix of this report, we can have that after you see what the content is and how it relates to the rest of the document. Okay, um, there's a couple of things that aren't on this list um, that are follow-up action items. So Karen, I promised to send you um, the specific document that's for your updating. I'll send it directly to you. Um, then Francie's going to follow up with Lynette and a couple of others on the water recommendation. And then there's a third follow-up around governance. Um, and so, uh, Bill and Marsha and Karen and Lisa self-identified, plus we'll ask the rest of the group if they'd like to participate. Um, it is gonna have to be a, a, a quick turn um, as we're hoping to have uh, at least a draft report completed by Friday. Um, so hopefully that will be able to be fairly expedient, even if it means presenting them with a couple of options um, if the group is able to come to a full resolution. Am I missing anything? Uh, before we close, and thank you for those of you who stuck with us to the bitter end. Um, we'll hope that the others have a chance to review the recording um, and the notes. Thank you. Thanks, Josie. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good, Good night. night. Bye, everybody. Yeah.